started in wildlife photography? I always spent time outdoors as part of my research and as part of my recreation. You know, I, I started going out uh, into the desert to really do animal surveys and research and the photography was more of a creative outlook because when you're a, a biologist you're always collecting data and you're looking at, at animals as numbers you know because that's how you view data and so photography is a really it's a different way of seeing the environment why focus on Sinai? I've been coming to Sinai since I've been a teenager. And so, you know, because um, when I would visit family in Egypt, we would often go to Sharm el Sheikh. And now when people think of Sinai, or at least if they go to Sharm, I mean, Sharm is very developed. But when I first started going to Sinai, it was like, it was considered like a true wilderness. Like, you know, there were, it, you didn't have regular power in Sharm. I think there were just four or five hotels on Nama Bay. And then when we went to Deheb, I mean, Deheb, they just, it was generator, electricity. I mean, you were cut off. And, you know, the, that was part of the allure of it. But they were areas that I had visited and I fell in love with. And then I decided to go back there to do research for my master's. It, it's just so beautiful. I don't know how you cannot fall in love with it. so special about the Sinai? Sinai has been inhabited for so long. Wherever you go into the desert, it is, um, you know, and you look for areas of, of wild, you look for wildlife, there are always in areas that have been inhabited by humans. I mean, you always find evidence of humans because wherever there's water, there's life. And wherever there's water, there's humans. I think that instead of what's so special, I think that it's how can it not be special? How can you not be seduced by, by Sinai? What would you say is the most astonishing thing about photographing in the peninsula? The mountains are amazing because the first rays of light are very selective. Like they kind of just peek in through the mountains and they just light up like a shrub or a tree while everything else is in darkness. So you almost like the sun is, spot, is like spotlighting on a certain element. And then at the same time, you know, those first rays of light, they, they light up the mountains as if like, you know, they're reliving their primordial volcanic existence. So it's very astonishing. It's very beautiful. And then of course you combine that with the desert and it's grand open vistas. And you know, you have that combination of that amazing lighting, the, 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 the scenery, and, um, and that's what makes it special. And then in the north, what makes it special is the sand dunes because it's very, it's a very simple ecosystem and it's just even structurally, you know, from a visual perspective, the sand dunes are so simple and you have all these, you know, repeating patterns. And then of course the sandstorms are also pretty special because it's almost like when you have sandstorms in, in North Sinai it, and the way the sand moves, it's almost like water. You get these, you get the high winds and you watch the sand, it's almost like being a flash flood of sand in the desert. What I really like about Sinai are the storms. That's probably one of my favorite parts because they, they uh, in the mountains or in the desert, they can happen pretty quickly and it can be quite violent and at the same time quite beautiful. You, you get a lot of emotion in the storms and you get a lot of emotions in this, you know, the first, the first lights of uh, the first rays of, of sunlight in the morning. I try to, to have the photograph show an emotion because that's what I want the viewer to see is to see that image and to see the emotion of being, I want them to feel, you know, to feel the same feelings I feel. Are there still some hidden remote areas that remain protected from tourists and the onslaught of hikers and poachers? There are still very remote areas inside. 
I, th- I don't think hikers and backpackers have really touched up on it. I mean, it's so grand, and even the, there's just not many places, because it's such a tough environment, there's not many places, and you know, if you exclude the beach, the beaches, there's not many, it's not very hospitable to allow humans to live there long term. A lot of it is, you know, you can backpack, you can, you can go somewhere, and you drink from the spring. But if you stay too long, you use all the water. In these mountains or in the remote areas, there's, you, you can't make it civilized. I mean, it's, it's, it's all, that's the allure of it. It's difficult to get. That most of the places I went to, you often had to have a camel. So uh, vehicles were not even accessible. So some of the trips, you know, we took like a, a 10 or a 14 day trip and we hiked 170 kilometers. And some of the areas were not even accessible to, don- to camels. We had to take donkeys. And then some of the areas we went to were not even accessible to the donkeys. We had to hike them on our foot. And so that, that for me is also the allure is that, you know, you go to these areas that are so remote. And yet when you go to some of these areas, you can also see how the environment has changed. Because like I said, wherever you go, you always find evidence of humans. If it's from several thousand years ago, you still see it there. Could you describe some of the challenges that you faced while you were in the Sinai? A rare wildlife is difficult to photograph because they're, um, they're, you know, they're so hard to see. I think in deserts in general, they are, um, they, they, they can be, di- it's difficult to observe wildlife. It's not like the rainforest where you're amazed by all the biodiversity. In Sinai, you're just amazed that there's life. And so when you find a grasshopper or a butterfly or a snake, I mean, you're mesmerized by it. It's almost like it, it's like on a pedestal. I think the main challenge is actually um, when you're in an area with a lot of livestock is the, is the fleas. That was the, uh, the main thing was the, the, as get, having fleas get in your sleeping bag because then they would just feed on you for the rest of the time. It's a Mediterranean chameleon, and um, they're pretty amazing because most chameleons what people associate with are like with, you know, vegetation, trees and shrubs. But they, um, they, they take a different approach to surviving in the desert, especially when there's not much vegetation. You would think a green, a green chameleon walking on the sand dunes would stand out, but they actually move super slow. It's a, I call it like super slow motion where they're rocking back and forth. And so from a distance, it just actually looks like a plant that's, you know, this would be blowing in the wind. I usually I notice them when I almost step on them and then I see that they're actually trying to run, even though they run slowly, to try to reach into the you know, safety area because they think that their bluff has been blown or something. And so that's how I photographed that chameleon is uh, I was just photographing it right after it was moving towards the, the, the shrub and I knew where it was going to because there's, I mean, there's not like there's many shrubs there. And so you can see it's, it's focusing on a destination and I just waited for it to climb. Is there one picture where you really struggled, where you spent hours, I mean, thinking the scorpions and the snakes and the foxes, could you describe one picture in particular where you really spent, you know, waited for hours for that perfect moment? Well, with the desert, uh, a lot of, um, I would say, a lot of it has to just do with spending time out there with desert wildlife, because you often are in these areas, and if you want to see wildlife, you have to spend more time there. I created, I would say, um, opportunities that I, I put myself for opportunities may arise. So there was the, the photographs of the fennec foxes. They were happened to be young foxes. We just actually happened to have lunch in that area. And because they're actually usually in the sand dunes, the foxes, the, the burrows tend to be in depressions where the sand is more stable. And so, you know, we've, we've had lot, we've sat near a bunch of burrows and we've never had foxes come out. But we were having lunch. And, um, and then we noticed that the young foxes started to come out of their burrows because we were eating, I, I don't remember if it was chicken or tuna. And they were very curious. And so what, uh, they're obviously their parents were not there. And so, you know, we were, we were prob- I was probably so shocked and, uh, you know, entranced by the opportunity that actually took me a couple few seconds to realize I need to get my camera. You know, because I just thought, you know, this is such a special encounter to have these baby foxes come within a few feet of me. And, um, and so by the time I got my camera, I was able to get a few photographs, and they were not shy. I mean, they, you know, they, they, they were too young to even fear humans at the time. And they had obviously been attracted to the uh, food. And then just by, just, you know, after I got my few photographs, I mean, it, must, it, it was probably no more than like five, 10 seconds, 
Then uh, one of the parents was on a sand dune, and it, it must have, she must have been, probably the mom was free, you know, obviously was disturbed by watching her offspring, you know, her, ki- her children playing, you know, interacting with humans. And she barked, and then they all scrambled down the burrow. And then the next day, you know, we, we knew we left them alone. And then the next day we came there, we tried to lure them out by, you know, the, by laying some tuna out. And, and so we, we poured out the tuna sauce everywhere and hoping they would come out. And sure enough, one of the young ones did come out. But within maybe five seconds, the mom came out and dra- a bit, you know, grabbed a hold of its back and uh, just dragged it down the burrow. The, the desert, I think, is more of a lot of special moments that you encounter. And um, you know, you get these magical moments that you know you'll probably never experience again. That, that encounter with a fennec fox, I'll probably never. I mean, I've seen other fennec foxes, but they've all been like, you know, uh, flashes where you see it, you surprise a fox walking somewhere and it, the fox takes off. Can we talk about hunting in the Sinai? Is it legal and, and how, how much of a problem is this? It, 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 is, it, it is illegal and it is, it is a problem. So like gazelles are on the verge of extinction. They still are, there's still a handful that occur in the most remote areas of Sinai. But now, um, I mean, now you have your SUVs, your Toyota Land Cruisers, they can go everywhere. And you have people with, uh, you know, state-of-the-art uh, weaponry from all the, the, you know, that have been inherited from all the wars. And so the combination of uh, these off-road pickups and uh, assault rifles that are, you know, I mean, the wildlife don't stand a chance because, you know, they evolved to avoid predators. And when humans, you know, used to hunt them, you know, maybe 50 years ago, they would hunt, They, you know, you couldn't, you couldn't hunt that many gazelles because you had to spend a lot of time tra- you know, uh, following them. And you know, you, you would be lucky if you, could, if you could shoot one and then you, you know, people would eat it and it would be such a big event. And once we had uh, SUVs, you know, these, these pickups become available with, the, you know, with, with these new uh, assault rifles or these, these new uh, weapons, um, then all of a sudden the animals are pretty much helpless. You could, you could wipe out a whole herd in a shorter time period than what people used to do just to hunt one gazelle. Animals that live on the open plains, like your gazelles, you know, those, um, you know, I'm, I'm fearful for their future because I could very easily see them being extinct in Sinai in 10 years. Because of the last remaining uh, gazelles, I mean, they're running out of places to hide. So unlike the ibex that have, you know, the mountains to always protect them. How rich and how rare is Sinai's biodiversity? Well, Sinai is is one of Egypt's richest biodiversity, and and it is a it is a it is a very uh, biodiverse desert, and they do have numerous endangered, globally endangered species. Like the Egyptian tortoise is globally endangered, and that is another species that you worry about people protecting for the pet trade because it used to be extremely common. I mean, you know, 30 years ago they were so common people never thought that they would actually ever disappear, just like the gazelles. And it just shows you within a short period of time how easy it is for uh, people just to, to wipe, the, wipe out their populations through either hunting or collecting for the pet trade. And that, that's the thing about the deserts is deserts are very rich, but they're also very fragile. Sinai is rich because it has water and the biodiversity is rich. And you have a lot of relic species, especially in the mountains, of back that have, have survived in Sinai from a few thousand years ago when Sinai was much wetter. So a lot of Sinai's wildlife um, come from a different era. And it's these, you know, these, these mountains are almost like islands of biodiversity where they're like refuges, refuges from climate change, past climate change. And so there is, a very lo- there is a lot of unique and rare wildlife in Sinai. Would you say that Sinai's flora and fauna are, are seriously under threat? I would rate it as serious under threat, especially the mammals, the large mammals, uh, your birds of prey, uh, for species like the Egyptian tortoise. I mean, the Egyptian tortoise is one of the most endangered tortoises in the world. And your gazelles in uh, Sinai are just a handful. Your large carnivores, like your wolves, are very few. Your hyena, striped hyenas are, are pretty rare. Your caracal cats are pretty rare. 
And so I would say of most of cyanized mammals, especially your medium to large sized mammals, are you know extremely are threatened with you know going extinct in cyanide. messages don't let the mountains the rough and, and inhospitable terrain and the ruggedness of Sinai uh, you know fool us because the desert is a very fragile ecosystem and if we push it too hard it will you know it, it, we, we will push it beyond the brink and the wildlife you know they do need our intervention and uh, and they need it quickly and uh, you know, otherwise it would be too late. And it, it, it's a shame that you know this this treasure that has you know evolved for thousands of years in Sinai can go can disappear within a, a period of thirty years. Mm -hmm.